Shall we jump into a bit of context on what was happening back during that time? So we know that when we're talking about the prophets, we're talking about some people who were living in a, in a, in a world very unlike our own. So they were living roughly in the 8th and 9th centuries B.C. over in another part of the world. Today we refer to it as the Holy Land. Back then it was two different kingdoms which around the Mediterranean Sea, those kingdoms were the northern kingdom of Judah, excuse me, the northern kingdom of Israel, Israel in the north, and Israel is sometimes known as Ephraim. So if we've seen that word before, Ephraim, Ephraim was another word for Israel, and then in the south was Judah. Israel is going to be the first kingdom to fall, and then after that, Judah is going to be the next kingdom to fall. Who are they going to fall to? They're caught between two big world powers. To the west of them lies Egypt, so they've got to be careful and they've got to be good to Egypt, otherwise Egypt is going to come in and crush them. And to the, to the east they have the empire of Assyria, the Assyrian empire. And so the challenge for these smaller kingdoms is that they have to be politically astute. If they align themselves with one against the other, then it'll give cause for the other to come in and, and destroy them. So in the mid-9th century BC, which for us would be the 800s, in the mid-800s BC, the Assyrian Empire began to impinge on Israel and Judah, simply meaning that the Assyrians had the idea that wouldn't it be something, Egypt is the other great power over here, that if we were to conquer Egypt, we would have all the land that belongs to Egypt. And so Assyria has its sight on marching to Egypt, but in order to get to Egypt, what does it have to pass through? Through Israel and Judah, what today is the Holy Land. And so the Assyrian Empire is beginning to impinge on Israel and Judah, but their movement is halted in various battles, including the Battle of Karkar in Israel, in 853 B.C., so they're trying to come down, but in order to come down, of course, there are going to be various battles involved. Tiglath Pileser III was the Assyrian emperor in 745 B.C., and it was Tiglath Pileser who began to rule the entire area, including a bit of Egypt for a time. What was happening at that time? The Assyrian success was built on a highly organized army, Think about this for a moment. If you have an army, but your army is made up of farmers who planted their crops back at home, and they're thinking about their crops and thinking, ooh, wait a minute, who's bringing in my crops? Then suddenly, Christopher, the farmer, is saying, love y'all dearly, but I have to go home and bring in the crops. Wait a minute, that was one soldier less. The other soldiers look around the room and say, wait a minute, you're right, I don't have anyone bringing in the crops for my family either. So it was the Assyrian army who had this intrigue organization where they didn't have to worry about soldiers going home to, to, to take in the crops. They, were, they had an, an organized societal structure in place. So the Assyrians were the first known people to use atrocities against civilians, including mass deportation as a penalty for rebellion. <coughs> Simply meaning that you have a choice here. If, if Assyria comes in, you have a choice. Either you can be a vassal to Assyria. And what does it mean to be a vassal? It means that you're going to live peacefully with them by giving them money. They have an army to support after all. Who's going to support their army? All of their vassals. And so we have to decide, are we going to be a vassal to them, paying for their army? And so how are we going to tax ourselves, because they're going to come in and say that they expect so much money from us, so how are we going to organize ourselves to pay the money that they're demanding of us? If we're rich, are we going to be happy to pay the, the bill ourselves? Or are we going to want to pass that bill off to others, like the poor? We, we're either going to be vassals to them, or they could use another strategy, that of deportation, simply meaning they're going to come in and make our territory their own, which means that we have to go. If they're going to annex our territory as part of their empire, then the rest of us have to go. Where are we going to go? We're going to be deported where? To Babylon. So we're going to know that 
time in our history as the Babylonian exile. When we're deported from our homeland, that period of our history is going to be known as the Babylonian exile. Hosea is going to be the last king of Israel. So we, we coexisted with the Assyrian Empire as vassals of the Assyrian Empire under the last king was, who was Hosea. The only challenge was that while we were being vassals to Assyria, paying them what we owed them in taxes, he broke the oath by conspiring with Egypt. Would Assyria be happy if they heard that suddenly we're having secret conversations, that the king is having a secret conversation with Egypt? That's not going to go over very well. And so the Assyrians come in and they seize Samaria. Samaria we know of as the region that those in the north in Galilee had to pass through Samaria on their way to the temple in Jerusalem. And so they're going to come down and seize that territory. They're going to deport 27,000 people, which is going to begin the deportations to Babylon, part of the exile. And they're going to move in their own foreigners. You know, if they're deporting us, what happens to our homes? Hmm. Don't worry. For those who are moving in, they have homes already constructed. Those that are not destroyed. It's a pretty good deal for the Assyrian army. The homes that we've built for ourselves, other people will come in and occupy our cities, our towns, because it's no longer our land. The example that we often use before we begin Mass on Sundays is that of Oklahoma. If the Republic of Oklahoma comes in and takes over the Republic of Texas, deporting us all into Mexico, got news for you, this is no longer Texas, this is now annexed as part of Oklahoma. Better pack up your families, let's all, let's all hit the road to, to Mexico. A Syrian is uh, present-day Syria, right? Or Almost. So present-day Syria is going to be another territory that we're going to get to in a moment. Okay. So, but this larger, that's an excellent question. The, it seems that it would be similar, but the modern-day, what we know of as Syria today, we're going to come across soon with another name, Amar. Hosea then is going to be the last king of Israel. Hosea's mistake is that he colludes with Egypt, thinking that, you know, if I go in alliance with Egypt, maybe we could fight the Assyrians back. Bad move. That was a fatal mistake for them. And so now that we've been deported from our homeland in Israel, Judah is still intact for now. Judah is going to be, the, the capital of Judah is Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is untouched for now, but the, the kingdom is now, the northern kingdom has fallen. Israel has fallen, and that creates a new situation for us because now we have all of these foreigners coming into our land, and now we are exiled into Babylon. So some of the Psalms are written during this time, talking about our exile, talking about how it was that we hung up our harps on the trees. What does that mean, that we hung up our harps? Harps were, music of, were, were instruments of music, of singing, and of joy. When we played the Psalms on our harps, that was expressing our joy to God. Time in exile was not a happy time. We hung up our hearts. Local deities and national cults were called into question. Think about this for a moment. If we were deported, then where was our God in all of this? Why did God let us be deported? Why did God let this foreign army come in and conquer us and ravage our towns and do what that army did? leaving us in this situation in a foreign land. Where's God in all of that? We turned our back on against God. Then what? Ooh, ouch. The prophets may, there may be persons who come up and say, you know what? It's probably your all's fault. It's your fault that you find yourself in exile. You were God's special people. You sinned. God punished you. How's that for a theology? So there was a lot of questioning about why it is that good, bad things happen to good people. How could God be present in the middle of all of, in the middle of all of that evil? Where is God? With those who are moving into our into our places, what's happening? They're bringing their gods with us, with them. Excuse me. They're bringing their gods with them. So, what does that mean in this entire situation? It seems that our God has abandoned us. It must have seemed like Yahweh was defeated by Ashur, the principal god of the Assyrians of the Assyrian Empire and that our disasters were due to our abandonment of Yahweh. Deacon Cleophas, that's his strong message. Being the prophet that he is, he comes in and says, people, repent. Why is all this happening? 
because you turned your backs on God. From a historian's point of view, historians tend to explain these things without reference to God. Interesting, because historians would take a look at all of the politics that were happening at the national level of all of these empires uh, seeking to have uh, the power and the influence in that land. They would attribute it to human beings like us, but the prophets saw it differently. You've sinned, you've turned your back on God, now this is what you get. And so, there were various attempts to purify the Yahweh cult. And when we use the word cult, it really doesn't mean anything bad. Cult is just another word for worship. So, our worship of Yahweh, obviously, we try, there, there were attempts when, when people introduced other gods into our land. There was an attempt to resist that and, and to purify the, the cult to Yahweh, to, to, to throw off these oppressors and their religion, which may explain why it is that our king, Hosea, had conversations with Egypt. Now that we are vassals of the Assyrian, of the Assyrian Empire, wouldn't it be nice if Egypt came in and helped us to free ourselves from that? As a people, we had, to, we had one of two options. Either we had to come to terms with this new situation of being vassals, or we had to risk annihilation, meaning if we didn't like this situation, then we could, of course, rebel. What's the risk in rebelling? Loss of life and or of everything that we have by being deported. For a time, we, we went with the situation, we got along. When we rebelled by having conversation with Egypt, that's when we lost everything that we had. And the northern kingdom fell. Israel would no longer be united again. Judah was a de facto vassal, but was never incorporated into the Assyrian Empire. So a de facto, de, de facto vassal, simply meaning that so long as we get along with Assyria, being closer to Egypt, so long as we get along with Assyria and pay them whatever tributes we pay to them, we don't have to worry about being stomped like our friends to the north. And so that likely gave rise to legends of miraculous deliverance. If we were to read the second book of Kings, in fact, let's open up the second book of Kings for those who have Bibles. Jerusalem's deliverance is foretold. How fascinating. But here we have all of our friends being taken over to the north and deported, but how it is that Jerusalem would be delivered from all that. Jerusalem was David's city, King David. So David's monarchy then was centered in Jerusalem. We remember David coming into the city of Jerusalem and dancing and singing, ringing the ark. That was where he established the temple. And so in verses 35 to 37, that night the angel of the, poor, the, angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. Okay, let's think about this from a historian's perspective again. This, uh, th this is probably a legend. To say that an angel of the Lord went out and killed 183,000 soldiers, I'm not sure about you, but I mean, in this world, God doesn't send out armies of angels killing 183,000 people at a time. Usually it's human beings doing things to one another. So if something happened to the, to the Assyrian army, it probably wasn't 183,000, and it probably wasn't angels. It was probably the human actors in all of this doing what it is that human beings do. I said it was a plague. So it wasn't contributed to a plague or something. It could have been a plague. In this, in this case, yeah. verse 35 is clear in saying it, the angel of the Lord. It almost gives you this image of the angel of the Lord with the angel going out and slaying 185,000 people a night. So as scholars, we tend to look at stories like this as legends, which may have been attributed to the fact that, wait a minute, if Israel fell, the question becomes, why did we not fall? Why? Because the Lord was on our side. The second book of Kings offers us a good story of how it was that we stood strong. Why? Because the Lord was on our side. In fact, the Lord sent out an angel that flew 185,000 members of the Assyrian army. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. So the king of Assyria broke camp and withdrew. He went to Nineveh and stayed there. One day while he was worshipping in the temple of his god... His sons killed him with the sword, and they escaped to the land of Ararat, and his sons succeeded him as king. Simply a legend about how it was that we survived. Why did we survive? Because God was on our side. 
the story of this period, the history of this period is often sketchy. So the challenge is that what we're talking about here is not the 21st century, when there are how many posts being made to Facebook every day about the events. I mean, if we wanted to reconstruct the history of Austin, Texas in 2015, I suspect that we have enough, we have enough sources between the internet and the newspaper and whatever television recordings are. I mean, there's, there's a lot that we could use to reconstruct the history of Austin in 2015. How, much, how many sources do we have to reconstruct the history of this part of the world in the 8th century BC? Not a lot. And a lot of that history may not be history because when we look at stories of angels killing 185,000 people, the question becomes, is that history? Is it a book of, is the Bible a book of history or is it a book of theology? Is it a book telling us what really happened historically? 185,000 people were killed by an angel in one night. Was it history or is it theology? Stories about how it is that God is on our side. Most scholars come down thinking that the Bible is a book of theology, talking about what it is that God does in history. God sends angels to defend us. In fact, there's a story of God sending an angel and killing 185,000 people one night. That's theology. 